Welcome. Hang on just a minute. I'm going to go live on Facebook. All right, we are live. Welcome to Victor's lecture. Victor is completing his instructor certification with Scuba Educators International. And I am so honored that he is part of our leadership team. Uh, I did wanna ask a couple of questions, Victor, if, you're, um, if you don't mind before you begin the presentation, let me just give everyone kind of a background about what's happening tonight. This is one of two nights where you are going to be giving a lecture. And this lecture topic um, is something that I think is a, a little bit new to you, a little bit. It's certainly not as comfortable as the last lecture that you gave in terms of your expertise. And so I asked you to speak on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the scuba industry. And you have 30 minutes tonight from the time we actually start the lecture. And then next week you have two more lectures and that's it toward your instructor certification. You will then earn your instructor certification after uh, those lectures and taking your exam this Thursday. So let me ask you, Victor, um, what are you most excited about with becoming an instructor? Well, to be honest, you know, I, I decided to pursue this path uh, in part because of today's presentation. Um, not only about diversity and inclusion, but I was thinking more about access. Um, I live in a, a low income county and I really, uh, you know, I have two teen daughters, 14 and 17. And I, sometimes uh, every year I try to go to the high school and to talk to the kids about marine careers and, you know, what they can do in college or just get a, you know, uh, a different um, activity that they can pursue in life. And of course, uh, I've seen the lack of of aquatic science in general, not only marine, but aquatic sciences in general for kids. And I saw that, I was thinking that scuba diving might be a good tool, a good way to get people engaged because that's what really changed my life when I was 12 years old. And, and that was what made me um, pursue my career in marine biology. And that was 37 years ago. Uh, 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it can be impactful in, you know, in, in youth. Uh, and I think if I become an instructor, uh, I can offer that to other kids. So I can pay back what I received from this uh, activity, which is, you know, is a life changing for not only for because of marine science, but we will talk about uh, other ways that um, scuba diving can change people's life. So you mentioned briefly, what, you, what do you do for a living, Victor? Well, I'm the uh, Marine Extension Agent for uh, Taylor County in Florida. And basically I'm an educator. Uh, I'm, I'm partially what I tried is to bring the uh, most up-to-date signs produced in the university to local stakeholders requiring to, um, to solve some issues. So I'm more involved into recreational fisheries and artificial reef and waterways management. Um, so these kind of topics that are, are uh, you know, important for the local coastal communities here in, in Taylor County. That's excellent. Victor, what's the first thing you're going to do, the first activity you're going to do as an instructor to, um, to bring scuba to youth? Because you said that's important to you. Yes, it is. And I already have everything rolling. So my first thing is the last week of June, I'm going to be teaching a 4-H uh, scuba diving camp. So I'm going to be hosting uh, for now, I think I have six, uh, 12 to 18 years kids. 
And I'm really excited, not only because we're not only going to go through the, you know, the traditional or, or the standards content of the open water uh, training, but also I'm going to address partially some ecological aspects and water quality, you know, more the science uh, of, of the ocean for them. And, uh, and I'm very, very excited to do that. So uh, it's very, I feel very happy to be able to start doing that right away. That's awesome. I was in 4-H as well, and it really helped me a lot as a kid to be in 4-H. So I'm so glad you're doing that. Last question before we go into the lecture, Victor. You decided to do your in instructor certification and your assi assistant instructor with me and my nonprofit, Life Worth Leading. Um, any surprises and what has been the, the thing that is most memorable to you about your experience so far? Uh, you know, camaraderie in the leadership team, I think it, it, it's really been impressive for me. I'm, I've never seen that before. And I think the, the, uh, poly, the, the policy uh, or maybe the way you approach uh, how to lead a group of and, and make this other diverse leaders as well as you uh, is is really impressive. So uh, that's been memorable to get to know all these other divers, uh, the how they enjoy uh, helping others to improve their skills and uh, while they improve their own skills. So that's that's always uh, you know very important. To, to experience. So I appreciate that, uh, Gabrielle. Well, fantastic. I want to thank you for being here and for being part of our leadership team and for being such a positive presence in the students' lives and in your community and far beyond. And so I know you're going to be a very effective, successful instructor, and I'm really happy for you. So at this time, you have 30 minutes to speak on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the scuba industry. Okay, so let's get it started. Uh, again, my name is Victor Blanco. Um, tonight, I want to go through a, a very, um, a, a topic that is on the table uh, more recently is some people will call it trending, which is diversity and inclusion in scuba diving. But um, before I talk, um, specifically in scuba diving, I will talk a little bit about the history and overview of diversity and inclusion, uh, part of the history behind that. Um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the diversity and inclusion in, in the scuba industry, and then how um, uh, SEI, which is our, our organization, our agency, address diversity and inclusion. And, and then we're gonna uh, go through some final remarks at the end. So as part of this, history and overview, uh, diversity and inclusion, the, the changes of how to address or how to, um, you know, to approach this situation is not recent. Actually, goes back to the 60s, and especially in 1961 with the executive order that created the affirmative action. The affirmative action is basically, you know, given everyone equal opportunity to be employed. After that, um, many different uh, uh, things happen through history. And I just wanted to, to mention some of those that uh, put a, a stone mark in that timeline. So in 64, we have the Civil Rights Act uh, that really made a, a change in the perception of everybody uh, as a citizen here in the US. And I'm gonna focus, of course, in the in, in US in general for, for now. In 1990, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act was uh, put into, um, into action. So um, that, that's also very important how people with disabilities were considered uh, uh, to be included in the rest of the activities of the, you know, everybody's uh, life, a uh, daily life. In 1993, the Family and Medical Leave Act that um, provided some time not only for mothers, but also for fathers when they have to take care of a newborn uh, member of the family. And more recently in 2009, we have the Lily, uh, the Lily uh, Ledbert Fair Pay Act 
that uh, you know somehow try to to make that balance between the imparities of payments in jobs between uh, males and females. Um, and, and after that, of course, many more things are happening and, and, and that history is, is not end, it's still on, on the go, right? So for the last two decades, uh, a growing body of research tell us uh, on the other hand that diverse and inclusive workplaces and agencies are linked to a greater innovation, talent retention, and profit. So diversity and inclusion is widely accepted as a business imperative. So most of the business, not only on the government side at different levels, you know, from the federal, state, and local levels, but also in the private industry, in the um, uh, this is being adopted widely. But diversity and inclusion um, is also a movement. And we all uh, read about this in the news and we see that in the news all the time. And that, it, and that movement have the roots in the social justice and, le and legal history. And, and that um, especially uh, made me think twice because you know uh, I'm not from, uh, from United States, I'm from Venezuela and we have different uh, cultures. And, and you know, the approach and the ways we see things are different. So it has been very interesting to understand why that changed. And when I saw the history, I saw that this movement really uh, rely on, on what is this called social justice and legal history. Um, but diversity is also can be a controversy. Uh, some people really are afraid to talk about this or or it can create and, you know, make some people uncomfortable to talk about this because uh, as Carly Holtz says, uh, people often re relate diversity uh, to race and gender and more recently to sexual orientation. But um, that's a, a pretty narrow view of what diversity really means uh, because it, it can mean a lot of other things, you know, like the way uh, of thinking, your intellectual background, uh, your training. And to the right, I put these two pictures. That's the logo of my of the University Internacional de Andalucía. That's in Spain. And I went to this university in 2000 to, make, uh, to take my first uh, master degree. Uh, this campus only takes 90 students per, um, uh, per period. Let's call it that way. So they only have three master's courses and 90 students. And um, when I went there, uh, I had the chance to study with people from 17 different countries and all of them with totally different backgrounds, different ages, different sex, different um, um, gender identities. And it was just so fantastic to uh, how much I learned from all of them. So I really agree with this that diversity is way more beyond the just, uh, you know, race, gender, or sexual orientation. It, it includes a lot of more other things, right? So what's the difference between diversity and, um, and inclusion? So diversity is a representation of many different types of people. As we said, gender, race, ability, religion, name it, okay? And diversity is often focused on the differences and is referred as the mix. So if this picture on the top to the right, uh, top right, we see all these ingredients, right? So uh, imagine that each one of those is one of these different ingredients. They all have something special. And inclusion is the deliberate act of welcoming di diversity and creating an environment where all different kinds of people can thrive and succeed. And that's the point of inclusion. So inclusion is the act of making the mix work. So when we mix all these ingredients, we, great, we, we have an, as an outcome, this wonderful cake that is uh, you know, fantastic. So if we don't really mix all this, it's very unlikely we're gonna have this outcome. So diversity is what you have and inclusion is what you do with what you have. So simply, simply having a diverse group, team, workforce, classroom is not enough. Uh, everybody should feel safe and encouraged to fully participate and share 
and be on equal footing as everyone else. And that includes all the type of aspect or all the different aspects of diversity. We talk about some of them, so like age, race, sex, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, physical attributes, education, your job title function or your skills. If you are uh, disabled, your height or weight, your marital status, your language, your country or origin or nationality, your financial status. And you can think about many, many other aspects that can differentiate us. And, um, you know, the, the good thing about to be different is that we can bring so much into that mix. So to be different is, uh, I would say, is, uh, is, is something beneficial. It, is, it doesn't play against us, totally the opposite. I would say it plays in our favor. So now that we have that big picture context of um, the diversity and inclusion in general, let's, let's talk about diversity and inclusion and access in the Cuba industry. So historically, we know is an activity that was led by men in major, uh, major age. And we see this picture to the bottom left, an old picture, you know, the first skew divers, old men. And then traditionally, this uh, industry and activity was led by white people in North American Europe. Okay, we all know the famous Jack Stowe, the creator of the skew equipment, all right? And uh, he was from Europe, of course. Friends, and uh, you know they really lead this industry, and um, it was that you know partial control of the industry. It, it has been changed with time, but that's what historically has been happening. But also the access to that industry has been restricted by high costs of the activity. You know, the courses are expensive, the equipment is expensive, the to service the equipment is expensive. To go to different places to enjoy a dive, if you want to take a, you know, uh, um, a tour or if you want to visit a different country to go dive in, it, it can be quite expensive. So not everybody has the financial resources to have access to this activity. We all know that the scuba, the scuba diving and snorkeling uh, industry in the United States contribute to about $11 billion of gross domestic product. And that's a huge amount of money. And only in Florida uh, is $2.1 billion. So California and Florida are the two main uh, states in the US that have really high demand on the scuba industry. So it's a, it's a really big industry producing a lot of revenue, a lot of direct and indirect um, jobs are created. Uh, so it's, it's really an important activity, not only in US, but worldwide, and especially in those countries that have some uh, really in, interesting places to go visit and dive. So I, I, uh, I would like to share these two uh, infographics. Uh, the one to the left oh, uh, speaks about open water diving and the one to the right, the continuing education in divers. So advanced divers, um, the, um, dive masters and up, okay? So when we see the one to the left for open water, at least 60% of the open water are male and then 39% are female. Um, to, to the left, we see uh, right here is the age composition of those in open water is basically ruled by uh, uh, 18 to 23 years old guy, uh, people and then decrease with age. But the most important thing here is the household income. So all green, purple, blue, and yellow is a uh, yellow is $75,000 a year or more. So we see that this is this industry is basically composed by uh, almost, um, let's say, 80% of people with high income. And that remains in the continuing education diving. Okay. So, uh, and, and also, uh, most of the people have, uh, you know, like a, a degree, a college degree or a graduate degrees. Um, 
But when you see the continuing education, there is a more balanced uh, composition in the uh, age groups. So um, we, we see that uh, people with more age are more involved into continuing education to become uh, advanced divers or dive masters, assistant instructor and instructors. And the, um, the percentage of males increased by 11%. So there's more, even more males in continuing education than females if compared with open water diving. These numbers are really you know, interesting because it means like, okay, what's going on? Why don't we have more people? Then um, let's talk about uh, real quick about some different groups. So what happened with women in scuba? Uh, we already saw that between 30 or 40%, depending on the source, it can be up to 50% of all open water diver students in social diving are women. Women tend to have better air management than men and use less air while scuba diving. And here are three uh, websites that really focus on uh, women in diving. Yeah, Girls at Scuba, the Woman Divers Hall of Fame, and Scuba Divers Live. And uh, women have some really amazing uh, records like uh, Karen Van Dem over in 2021, uh, 2021 in South Africa have the deepest scuba dive to 236 meters. So that's uh, multiply that three times and that tells you how much is that in feet. So it's almost 700 feet. And longest open saltwater scuba dive was 51 hours and 25 minutes by Christy Quill in 2015 here in US. And the deepest free dive is 260 meter by Tanya Street in two, uh, 202, 2002 in the Turks and Caicos Islands. So uh, women, women really do great in scuba diving. And you know, we have our instructor, Gabrielle, is a good representation of that, of course. Um, I wanted to mention two really important um, women in scuba, there, Dr. Sylvia Earle and Eugene Clark, both are very renowned divers. Uh, they are, um, they have worked as marine biologists, they have written books, and they have worked in ocean conservation. And um, actually, it is, there are some role models that have been inspiration to the new generations of uh, women, women in scuba. Then uh, we have disabilities in scuba. Uh, we all, oh, we are familiar with the Handicapped Scuba Association, HSA, and that's the uh, website right there. It started in 1975 as a research program with the University of California, Irving, and then uh, officially funded in 1981. But it was in 1986 when HSA became an independent diver training and certified agency. Uh, and they provide uh, programs for people with disabilities, dive body courses, and instructor training courses, which are internationally recognized. Actually, I'm getting with Gabrielle right now to become a certified dive body. Uh, I'm, I'm going through my dive body course. And HSA has about 5,000 instructors and dive bodies located in 45 different countries. Of course, they work with different partners, and, 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 and the good thing about disabilities, and I heard about this with my friend Ronnie and other uh, people who Gabrielle have get involved, like wounded warriors or some veterans, uh, is like how scuba diving really helps them to overcome fear, pain, anxiety, you know, all these traumas that uh, they are facing because of their uh, situation. So, um, or their condition. So that it really makes me you know, very, it's very inspirational to, to see how uh, this group of people overcome their challenges through a scuba diving. Then we have a black indigenous and people of colors. That's what BIPOC uh, stands for in scuba, the National Association of Black Scuba Divers, uh, NABS was founded in 1990 with, uh, and currently have about 1500 members and to, uh, 51 affiliate clubs. That's the website right there. Uh, it was created by, uh, founded by Dr. Jose Jones 
who was a marine biologist, and Rick Powell, a former Navy SEAL, two of the earliest African Americans to become certified divers. Uh, they have different uh, sister clubs. Uh, some of those were uh, founded actually before uh, the foundation of the, uh, of the NABS. Uh, one of those is the Underwater Adventure Seekers in Washington, DC. So their mission is to promote scuba diving, water skills, and environmental awareness into the African American community. And um, there are different groups. There's not only, a, we also have like Black Girls Dive Foundation, which focus only in Black girls in, in uh, aquatic science. And there are all different organizations like MIS, which means Minorities in Shark Science. And they provide a scholarship for, um, you know, undergrads and high school girls to explore aquatic science and pursue a career in aquatic science. Now let's talk about the LGBTQ plus in scuba diving. So we know um, there are a lot of cross references, but the average percentage of the global population identify as a LGBTQ plus is about 3%. And in US is about 7.1%. So this suggests that there is about the same percentage of divers worldwide who identify as part of this uh, important group. So, um, there are different uh, groups out there that uh, really bring a lot of support to LGBTQ plus in scuba diving. Uh, diving for Life, starting in 1992, he uh, was a veteran diver who got uh, AIDS. And then he, um, he uh, started uh, coordinating these uh, jamborees to bring together the LGBT community and to raise funds that were used to fight the virus. And they do it every year, actually this year, uh, I think they're going to uh, Fiji. Um, there are different here in Florida, we have a different of uh, clubs uh, or SCUBA um, organizations that support LGBTQ plus. Uh, one is in Tampa, the other one is in Miami Shorts. But I know every day more organizations are more open to attend this uh, um, group. Uh, NOAA, uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Pride Outside combined the celebration of Ocean Month and LGBTQ uh, plus Pride Month right now in June. So right now they are uh, doing this campaign, which is Pride in the Ocean. And we see a picture to arrive. Uh, there are, however, some countries which incredible dive sites that still do not recognize same-sex relationships. I remember making a post in Scuba Friends about a dive site in, um, I think it was in, in a Far East country. And one of our uh, friends who belongs to this group, to his in the LGBTQ plus uh, um, group, he said, like, I wish I could go, but this country is not LGBTQ plus friendly. So that really, you know, makes you feel like, well, why is this? He's just another diver. He's just another person like anybody else. But, uh, you know, it's partially because of, of changes on cultures. And um, so the, the challenge is actually to, to break those bar cultural barriers that, um, you know, create different, differentiate us. There are different organizations, travel companies that only focus in these groups like undersea expeditions. And there are Facebook groups or uh, like gays and lesbian underwater club where, you know, people feel comfortable sharing um, what to do, organizing trips and all that. So it's, it's fantastic that they have a, a place, a different place and then different organizations where they can, you know, uh, just be themselves and, uh, and feel safe. So it is not about your identity and uh, it's about seeing sport and sporting environments as safe spaces and somewhere to feel comfortable and uh, at ease. And this was mentioned for the LGBTQ um, publication that I read, but I think this applies for everything. Now, um, SCUBA that carries in the international standards and procedures actually address this topic. So throughout the manual, they refer to the, to the, uh, the term he or his is your use genetically. 
uh, and means he or she or his or hers. Um, despite they make this note, uh, maybe there is always room for improvement uh, because some people who are non-binary uh, might say, well, I don't feel identified with these uh, standards. So, um, but anyway, in part one, their philosophy of as Cuban educators, they state that leaders are wel welcome and embrace people of different ages, incomes, abilities, races, and religions. So here is some room for improvement in our standards as well to you know, create a, a more diverse group of, uh, so anyone who reads these standards can feel uh, identify and somehow uh, they, they belong. When caring and scuba instructors create a safe and inclusive environment like any other wholesome activity, scuba becomes a tool for personal development. SDI programs achieve these goals and instructors promote good physical, mental, and spiritual health through providing recreational diving opportunities and contributing to a better quality of life for all participants. So basically what this says is that we are open to anyone who wants to enjoy and to you know uh, just try to uh, get physically, mentally, and spiritually better. In the third part of their policies uh, in these standards, they have the policies and procedures. And there, they're explicitly uh, mentioned uh, divers with asthma, uh, divers with diabetes, and the divers with disabilities. And the two first is they just mentioned protocols, but for people with disabilities, they actually have some policy. So SEI has been and continues to be dedicated to meeting the needs of all people including those with disabilities, and this is a copy paste from the standards, providing them with the opportunity to reach their fullest potential and enhance the quality of their life. And according with this philosophy, SEI has been proud to assume the leadership role in dealing with disability issues as they apply in the diving community. And a couple of weeks ago, there's, there's an example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Gabriel and a group of SEI divers went to Orlando to this activity that they do every year to support people with disabilities in the scuba industry. Now, how to embrace your diversity? And this applies for anything in your life. So first, everyone's narrative. We are all different. Um, this, some, sometimes you will hear this about a bias. So yes, we are all biased. And, and sometimes we will have what I call the bad bias. And sometimes you will have the good bias because that's what you, you live. You know, you, you have your culture, you have your values, you have your own experiences and you what who you are, it was shaped by all that that you have lived. So it's very difficult to, to give up that for something else, but you have to, you know, understand that other peoples have different experiences, different values, and just accept and respect. You can be different and anyway, respect each other. Where are you coming from? Whether you find yourself thinking poorly of someone, stop and consider that influence have created your negative views of that individual. Uh, befriend of, of all people, that's very important. Uh, the more people you know, uh, the, the better you are. It's, it's, it's gonna make you grow as a person. Empathy, that's very also, also very important when you uh, encounter anyone, just imagine and understand and sympathize with that person's history, that's empathy. Actively accept, M uh, meditate upon embracing those people and that, you know, just accept that you are different, that's a gain for both of you. And show compassion, just, uh, perform random acts of kindness of all types with all people. And he can, you know, uh, smile, small things can make uh, big changes. So we as a scuba divers also have to do different things. So we break barriers when we connect with people to which in everyday life, you may not probably never think you could connect with. Uh, when you are in a charter boat, you don't know who's gonna be there. So break those barriers and, you know, we are there in the same boat for the same reason, okay? Uh, just the wetsuit, not the designer suit. You will all wear, you know, our wetsuits. There's not branding. We're all the same. We look all alike. We all speak the same language on the water, which is our bubbles, 
or or science. So uh, that um, can is a way to connect with everybody in the scuba industry. We're not diving to flirt, brag, or win. So your finances, education, their physical abilities don't make the slightest difference in how good a diver you are. And my friend Ronnie shows that every time he goes in the water, he's just such a good diver. And I'm really, really impressed of how good diver he is. Sharing a common passion and relying on each other. Uh, so when you have your dive body, you have you are there for that person and that person is there for you. So you are both sharing the same thing and scuba diving gives us that opportunity. Now, before I finish, I want to share this uh, short video that uh, really resembles uh, one of the most important things uh, that I presented throughout the presentation today. Well, just as a final thought, I think that we need to uh, remember that uh, we're part of a mix. Be that part of the mix and be a mixer as well. So thank you very much. And um, I guess you might have some comments or questions. So I, I was right on time, right, Gabriel? Yes, good job, Victor. Thank you. That is a very important topic and it's a challenging topic to talk about but it's an important one. Uh, 
I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions. So how about those of you who are live with us on the Zoom first? Anyone who's in attendance who has any questions, please pose them to Victor. Yeah, could you tell us a little more about some of the uh, equipment we use for um, our divers with disabilities? Some of the what? Uh... Some of the equipment, um, some of the, like the adaptive equipment that we use. Yeah, so when when we go through the HSA uh, training, the first thing is to understand all the different type of disabilities that are out there, right? It can be a physical disability in general, you know, maybe uh, from the movement uh, point of view, hearing, visual. Um, so depending on the level uh, of disability, they're, they're, the industry have developed different um, tools or equipment that uh, address the need of those that group of people. So in, in the case of people with uh, um, uh, quadriplegic or um, paraplegic, they, they like, like you, you use like this gloves with you know, the inter finger membranes uh, that really helps you because you know you, you can kick so it makes no sense to have to wear uh, fins but uh, you uh, you master the art of swimming with your hands especially uh, in your case as a good swimmer it, it, it feels so natural in you I remember the first time I went behind you in blue grotto it's like hey how he got he goes so fast it, it was amazing to see you just just swim very fluently in their water it's just magnificent then we have for example for other groups like the full face mask those group of uh, uh, people with disabilities that um, are unable to hold a regulator in their mat in their mouth so the full face mask really brings uh, or provides them with the best tool to really be more comfortable underwater to enjoy uh, the dive. Uh, in the other hand, we have our this training dive uh, body um, uh, system or you know body divers who are there for them to provide assistance as needed. So some some divers will need uh, one body to dive with them. Some others will need two body divers with them. Um, uh, but um, all the time, the mix between the equipment and the bodies is what really makes it uh, comfortable and safe for uh, the people with disability. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? So Victor, this is Bill. You mentioned the, uh, the higher cost of uh, scuba diving. What are a few ways but you could get past the financial hurdles in areas with low income? Well, that's a really good question. And I, I, I still think that's a general challenge, right? Um, despite there are several organizations, a lot of organizations out there providing, you know, uh, scholarships like Gabrielle does through her uh, non-for-profit, uh, exactly what I'm planning to do with a Taylor Country Reef Research team here for uh, you know, veterans or uh, people with low income or uh, underrepresented kids. Um, it, this is still you know, the industry and especially when time is, is moving forward, uh, new equipment and new technology is included into the industry. And of course that new technology uh, usually brings more, uh, uh, it's more costly. Uh, and, you know, these all, uh, let's say, you know, all uh, models, uh, they stop producing those, so uh, they get discontinued from, from the industry. Uh, so one of the best way, I think, is to still continue uh, campaigning to get partners and to make people understand uh, you know, at the different levels, at the uh, public level, like the government, all different, uh, you know, levels of the government and uh, private sector, uh, how important is to uh, promote 
this activity through some, um, you know, maybe sometimes target who to really um, uh, provide those support and those scholarships. Um, and I think that's that's one of the ways or a couple of the ways that we can address that uh, situation with the um, lack of or, or of access to the industry, to the scuba industry. That's great, Victor. Does anyone else have questions? Love to have questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Kim. Um, so I currently work in a uh, rural community. I live in Tallahassee, but I work in a um, predominantly African American school district that is very small. Uh, a lot of our youth are very troubled, and they need programs like this to have hope, to have to open their minds and expand their worlds. Their worlds are, and I can say this because I work there. It's very limited and it is um, historically limited, it's generationally limited, and a lot of them cannot swim, a lot of them have not been exposed to this world. How do you bring in a program like this and open their minds and, and expand their worlds? They desperately, desperately need something besides the small world they live in. And you know, my, my biggest fear for them is that when they come into a community like Tallahassee, which is only about a half an hour away, 20 minutes away, it's a completely different environment for them. They are closed off and they need, they need this because their community is failing, their schools are failing and they need something, they need hope. And they need something besides just their daily existence. So what, what can you, what do programs like this, how do you come into communities like that? when it's so limited? Yeah, so I, I think the first aspect is to, to uh, spread the word out that we are here and that we are willing to help, right? So uh, sometimes, we, you know, like we don't know what community or what school have this need or they are willing to, or, or they need uh, people like us to come and just try to offer uh, an alternative to their, you know, their life or their, you know, reduce uh, um, exposure to experiences, right? And um, so I, I would say just just get in touch with us, with Gabrielle, with me, and we're more than glad to to you know to explore options. Uh, we can uh, go there and maybe first have a small like you know motivational sessions with them and and then first of course we need to overcome some of the barriers like not swimming and and here in Perry in Taylor County we have the same issue some of these kids they they don't know how to swim and there is not a public pool here so I I wish there if there was a public pool I would go and deliver swimming lessons for free I would do it for free I taught my daughters how to swim my wife and I would do that for anybody who wants to learn uh, no charge I, I have my profession I, I make a good living out of it um, so it, it's not about the money it's, it's about you know giving back to the community and and help them to to grow because as they grow you grow with them and that's the the most important thing so and after overcoming that challenge or that barrier of swimming then we can you know, uh, in, or in the meantime, we can start reaching out to different organizations that might fund some scholarships, or we can have a campaign to, you know, like uh, sponsor one, uh, one youth. Uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, different businesses or organizations in town or out or, you know, around the state will be more than willing to, to help to donate for that uh, cause. Uh, and there is a lot of funding out there, and even grants. So uh, if, we, if we have this type of, of need, um, first we need to have the need assessment, to know exactly what you need, and then we can come up with a plan to address that situation. So uh, I invite you to 
stay in contact with uh, Gabrielle and myself and and we will definitely find a way to to help. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are you uh, if you don't mind me asking, are you in Gadsden County? Yeah, I am. So um, so yeah, we I would love to make a difference in Gadsden County. And I, I work a lot with Gadsden County in other capacities professionally, and I know the challenges. Um, yes. Yes. So yeah, I, I think that if you don't mind me sharing a little bit of my dream, even though this is Victor's thing, my dream is to build a warm water aqua therapy center um, that benefits people with disabilities, um, chronic illnesses and injuries. But part of that aqua therapy center, I want to be, the ability to teach swim lessons, um, especially for populations that are underserved. And right now, Florida A&M University is, they have a program and they suspended it because of COVID um, the, the past two years, but they do have a, a, day, a, a swim in day where they, they bring people in and teach them how to basically at least save their lives. Now we we teach scuba currently the pool we use is Florida A&M University and I think you know it's just a fantastic pool great um, people we work with there coach there is awesome everybody is amazing um, so and I don't know if Gadsden County has a pool um, I don't know either I just started working there um, within the last three months and uh, my apologies but the impact I've had just by being positive and being open-minded and, and, and opening myself up to all, helping them open up to possibilities is, everybody's very receptive. The biggest problem is transportation because yeah. so many parents can't or won't or limited in those abilities. I think Victor has some great ideas. Some of the things he mentioned, I think we could get you know a bus sponsor to bring people to Tallahassee if there was not a public pool available in Gadsden County. Um, I really do. And I, I know that this leadership team um, cares and we don't want anything to be a barrier. And that includes finances. We don't want anything to be a barrier. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, scuba should be for everybody. But obviously the first thing is you got to learn how to swim because people who drowned overwhelmingly, the, there's a much higher percentage of people um, who are black who drowned yep. than any other population. And we need to change those numbers. We need to make sure that, you know, that, that swimming is universal and yes. um, that it's provided for everybody. So I love Victor's ideas too around that. Excellent. Wonderful. Idea. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any final thank questions? You. Victor, good job. Let me jump over to Facebook and make sure I'm not missing any questions there. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's see. I don't see any questions there. So uh, last chance for questions before I close this up. All right. Well, listen, Victor, you did a fantastic job tonight. Anyone who enjoyed um, Victor's lecture tonight, he has two lectures next week as well. He doesn't yet know the topics. He will learn one of them very soon. And the other one, he's not going to learn until 24 hours beforehand. Um, <laughs> but yes, thank you. You did a great job, Victor, and i um, super proud of you. And uh, this topic is near and dear to my heart. And I think you did a really good job with it. Thank you, Gabriela. I really enjoyed uh, going through the information for this topic. And I, I think it's, it's, it's it's a game, it's a train, it's not a game, it's a train that we need to ride together. Uh, everybody like, come on, come on board, we're living, so let's let's go on. And um, it, it can change your mind. It, sometimes I, 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 I declare myself guilty, sometimes of not understanding some of the things, uh, but you know, every day and, and bringing the topic uh, and talking about it is what really, makes you, you know, understand. And with understanding, change, change comes, comes itself. You, know, you don't need to be pushing anyone to change. You just, just need to make people to understand. I think that's, that's the difference. Absolutely. And I did want to point out that um, SEI is very receptive to being um, inclusive fully. 
And I've already had conversations with Ben at SEI and he's very open to it. If you notice, I've already changed language in the standards that I share with the students. I no longer say him, her, his, I, I have gender neutral language. And I really think that um, we need to have more of that so that everybody feels included. And yeah. so, yeah, so I agree that we have, we have a ways to go. And the thing is, we're all learning. Everybody's learning. Even if you're part of one of these communities, you're learning, yeah. you know, and it's about being respectful. It's about being open-minded. It's about being kind. It's about not ever thinking you're better than somebody else because you're from a certain place or you have a certain color of skin or you have certain abilities or anything else. So so thank you. Any final um, comments, Victor, before we close out the evening? No, I appreciate that. Thank you again, Gabrielle, and to the leadership team. It's, it's been a great journey. I'm very excited to move forward to my next uh, presentations next week and get awesome. my certification. All right. Good job. Thank you, Will. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. All right. Good Thank night, you. everyone. Thank you. Jacob says very exciting. <laughs>